to thank Stoney, Stoney and the whole open air Montana crew. That residency program is an amazing thing, and I can't believe it's here. I'd also like to thank the Flathead Lake Biological Station for having me and for being so welcoming and staying at like different people have spent hours telling me about their projects and um, I just really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank the University of Montana, the Zootown Arts Community Center, and the Radius Gallery because all of those folks in Missoula have, they've just really supported me as an artist and mainly it's like just their belief in art and um, their belief to keep exploring. So here we go. First, I'm going to go through some images of my time at the Flathead and just so you can kind of get an idea of what I've been up to. And then I'm going to go through a bunch of my thesis work in kind of more, in more depth so you can, because I spent the last year doing that, and so you can kind of get an idea of where I'm coming from. All right, here we go. So this is where Claire and I have been for the month of October <laughs> and it's it looks different every day. And so I just wanted to show you some pictures of, this is pretty much from the same little point that our cabins are out on over here. And like I would wake up in the middle of the night to, and wander outside to like go to the bathhouse and then, you know, see the Milky Way. <laughs> so I got to be confronted with the awesome power of the universe and my small, minuscule existence at 3 in the morning, <laughs> which has been great. And so the weather has been, it's kind of been like some spring days and then also some winter days and some, we had some, some weathery days. And there's Claire and I, we kind of would adventure around. And they have a nature path around here that I've been on a bunch, and there's a lot of different bear scat on it that's full of cherry pits. <laughs> and then there's a flicker feather and some leaves. And then this is a trail down the road, and um, you can get a really good view of the lake, and the, the leaves were totally magical and full of them out there. And there are cabins, and we put some little prayer flags on there, or I did, and they are, when they flutter in the wind, they're supposed to release prayers and good, good thoughts into the world, and they're supposed to disintegrate. And then here's the inside of the cabin where I've been working, and you can kind of see how the space is set up. And then that's what I did, that's the bedroom, and that's what I did with the extra bed, so I could clear out the studio space. <laughs> And then here's some drawings I started with when I got here. And that was the first time I'd used felt pen on these panels instead of just ink, and it was a lot more immediate, and so I've been trying some things out. And then Stephanie took me out to do some sampling of zooplankton, and on a beautiful day, and that's the little sock that she dropped into the water to pick up all the, the planktons, and then <laughs> <laughs> all my scientific words, and, um, and then that we looked at them in the microscope, and I do know this is called a Daphnia, right? Yeah, I got it. And then <laughs> these are some more zooplankton, and that one at the top, some mice and shrimp, and those are rotifers, and they're the smallest, and they're the only ones that eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they're really cute and tiny. <laughs> and then we went on a sampling trip with Jen Craft and Jen Elzer, and the UN Honors students, for mice and shrimp at like nine at night, mm -hmm. and there was no lights in the lake, and it was totally clear, and so there was a billion stars, and wow. the students were really excited, and so they they had this huge crank that they cranked down into the lake, and then they cranked it up for like ten minutes to get deep enough, and then they pull up this like little jar from this huge process, and then inside there are all these mice and shrimp, which are invasive, and we hate them, and they're not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but what we really don't want is the muscles because they will for sure be totally the evil. <laughs> all right, so then after seeing all these um, scientific gatherings of zooplankton and shrimps, I decided I wanted to make a, definitely make a piece with a bunch of these creatures in them, and so I did a sketch. And then normally I don't sketch out the works before I do the painting, I just kind of go for it. 
Um, but this time, I wanted to make sure I got certain things in and that it was fairly successful, so I made a sketch. And then here's kind of the work in progress. We've got a girl with water coming out of her face, and then we've got some daffia and some shrimp that we're going to be roasting with fire, and you can see the work over there. <laughs> and then there is more progress happening. And then I'm adding some waves behind it, and it's going to need some more black waves on the left hand panel. You can tell it's kind of sparse over there. But yeah, um, this is a, a very more flowy sort of, I have never just concentrated purely on water and on sort of like one week of experiences with humans um, and thinking about making it work. And so a lot of these characters, you know, Drew was drawing them. You know, I was thinking about some of the people I talked to, and like Stephanie and some of the scientists, and like here's some girls like holding up their version of microscopes to look at the creatures, and and then I started a demon painting, and I just included these pictures so you can see where it started from. And this is also new for me uh, that I actually let some more scary demon creatures into my work because a lot of times my work does deal with sort of heavy subjects, but always the characters are pretty, they're normally like animals and girls, so they're not that scary. But these demons got uh, more scary. And so I did some drawings from my Tibetan Tonka book. And like nobody does demons like the Tibetans. Mm -hmm. And there's a skull with eyeballs coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And so here we go, we got some more demons and fire. And um, mm -hmm. And so this drawing sort of evolved, and it's been uh, very exciting for me to do this piece um, because I had kind of been feeling like something was missing, and I think it was this edge. So that's kind of where I'm going. And you can kind of see some of my influence from William Blake here, too. All right, so then I started to draw with the feathers, and it was wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> and then here's some of the, the books I've been reading while I've been here, and a lot of them are fantasy and sci-fi novels, as well as some graphic novels, and some books about William Blake, and some Buddhist um, topics that are actually related to some William Blake uh, sort of psychological reflection. I really like to read. <laughs> what did you like the best? Huh? Oh, like the one I like the best? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really tough. <laughs> I liked them all a lot. I think that the Marvel 1602 graphic novel really surprised me because I haven't read a lot of comic books. And this Neil Gaiman, but I really trust Neil Gaiman as a storyteller. So he, um, he did a really good job. He put all of these comic book characters back in 1602 and then so they treated them kind of like with the period, and they went all, they like worked all together, and it was had more depth than I expected it to have. But yeah, all of these books are actually really great. Diana Wayne Jones is excellent, and she obsessively wrote for children. But I think discerning adults will also really appreciate her. All right, so then I tried to do some diagramming. This is for my house at home, and then I moved it here, and I was gonna. I had some plans for it, but then it kind of freaked me out to, um, because the things that I was putting in this diagram really didn't want to be um, logic to be used on them, because they're more about direct experience of life. And so when I, for instance, if I put a card on here that said ecstasy, it seems like to fall far short. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna go into some of the past year of my thesis work and I'm going to do some more formal reading from this paper so I don't uh, miss anything super important. All right. <laughs> so this is an animation I made. Um, used, it was an experiment. And so this person is in an ice cave or a mine cave. And those are portals. Okay, so this painting is called Underwolf, and it's six feet by four feet, and it's ink on panel. And I have a poem that goes with it. Alice licks a pop and goes inside her mind, splashing ink abounds and mon monkeys intertwine. 
Hair blowing back, my torso made of frog, legs swirling down to touch upon the slog. Monkey under wolf, mice playing in clouds, holding a flow of ink that won't become a shroud. Reclining all in wolf haunch, erratic sins and arm, touching wonder water without alarm. My, my arm of flamingo looking up and over all, my other hand creates a window for the flow of fall. So this is the card for my thesis show, and it was called Heart to Vomit in the Dream Army. <laughs> Um, so, Hard Vomit, Vomit the Dream RV featured mural-esque ink paintings on panels and abstract ceramic figures overflowing with imagery. Um, delineated in fluid black ink, alert and smiling girls and Buddhas interact with multi-headed rats and rabbits emerge from snail portals while hither and thither fish churn ink oceans. The characters in the painting process represent relationships, modes of thought, events, places and feelings. The energetic nature of the composition causes the viewer's gaze to move around, connecting the images to construct their own stories. In doing so, the viewer enters the unfolding universe, Michelle Land. <laughs> Michelle Land. Um, the universe of Michelle Land is inspired by all art forms, from Hellenistic statues and ancient Hindu temples to super flat, from Hieronymus Her Bosch to Legion. Michelle Land is a port of departure for art made of infinite reflections on psychological and physical realities. Both the 2D and 3D works feature the same cast of characters uh, from Michelle Land, and these characters enter and emerge from portals, pools of ink, centers of flowers, and even one another's knees or ears. The work is full of both joy and danger, nurturing and aggression. The animals are warm and cuddly, may have fangs, rough fur, or wild eyes. Hair is an opportunity to express something about a character, and some hairdos are crazy, while others are flowing and made of linear or swirls, and so they're more calm. Many of the animals are constructed with a variety of mark making or patterning, furthering their symbolic nature, because these sort of abstract forms are incorporated into the image. No matter how weird things get for the characters, they retain their pleasant insouciance or casual lack of concern. And so here's some examples of some paintings. And both the figures and the animals um, undergo scale and location shifting and occupy different positions of importance within the painting. So, you know, like a girl may be giant or she may be really tiny, and same with the mouse. An example would be raccoon lotus. And um, and you can see sort of that scale shifting in different positions of importance happening mm -hmm. in this picture. And the characters in this painting move in tent. Each one engages with one another or the environment. And in general, the, the female figures interact with animals and not with one another as much, which is something that I noticed throughout the works and was not intentional necessarily. The position of their eyes often belie the directions in which their bodies are moving. So for instance, these eyes will um, direct the viewer's own gaze, and this girl with a monkey demon coming out of her stomach is like looking down off the page, prompting the viewer to ask the question like, oh, what could be over there? You know, like she's got this monkey demon, but she's looking over here. <laughs> All right, so the character's gaze is used to extend the story beyond the panel plane for the viewer. A lot of times I've been asked which character is me, and they're all me. They all come from my mind, from my personal ideas about everything and everything I've ever encountered. The characters are my perception, they're concepts. As life moves forward, these characters and symbols respond accordingly and evolve. Depending on the combination and, and composition of the characters, their compositional size, like the style I did them in, or their proximity to other characters, um, all these things will tell me something about how I view the world because it's kind of an intuitive process and sometimes this is very uncomfortable and if I acknowledge something uncomfortable in the painting then this is an opportunity for me to change something in my behavior or attitude about life. Mm -hmm. um, but the reverse is also true, sometimes I get unexpected joys that I didn't know I had uh, by looking at the images later. 
Um, the somewhat the goat and the tiger, I've inherited from my friends symbolic languages, and the raccoon emerged over time to fill a need in my visual language for a um, feral, mischievous entity. Others trickle in from books, cartoons, and dreams, and pop culture. Anything I see in the world is fair game. I rather, I try to allow the symbols to manifest rather than tell them what to be necessarily. And so it's an intuitive connection making process after I just, you know, read a thousand books. <laughs> All right, the characters of Michelle Land are a little kooky, but always they represent truth and acceptance of their position in the art world. So now we're going to talk about my process a little bit. And my process is designed to have a lot of, of freedom, including moments when the content and the form fold in on one another and cannot be separated. I will discuss the broad process ideas and in particular how works get made. So I try to make a balanced, good looking work and the density and complexity of the compositions tightens the act of negotiation in the work between positive and negative zones. This forces me to more, be more mentally and physically present because ink is permanent. Any mistake that I make has to be acknowledged and integrated into the whole of the work. Like I can scrape off some stuff with an X-Acto knife, but not that much. <laughs> so this process of negotiation is kind of a metaphor for life because you can't take anything back. After laying in the court, and oh, we're not to chaos yet. <laughs> so first I put in the court image, and then I saw the formal issues around the court image with the metaphorical solutions. Like you saw with the demon picture, I had like a court image that I started with, and then stuff started kind of filling in around it. And then a lot of times responding to an unexpected ink event or mistake just involves me just being okay with it or adding more of it to um, as like be like embracing it as a good thing and adding more of them on purpose. <laughs> All right, so now chaos by its very nature cannot be predicted, only explored or experienced. While chaos epitomizes the unknown, the unknown is full of possibilities to perceive anew. This is why chaos is important, and the chaos mark making process is important to me. When I engage in the chaos mark making, I am physically manifesting the chaos through a, like, a lived chaotic experience through ink in order to get another view of it outside of myself. Chaos marks are evidence of energetic emotional experience, and they are without definition, while representational imagery reflects the lived experience. So you can construct narratives out of that, whereas this is just like total you know, experiential vomit. <laughs> the chaos marks create a point of entry for the viewer. For example, if you look at Underwolf and Raccoon Lotus, um, Underwolf has the chaos marks and it kind of jumps out at the viewer, whereas Raccoon Lotus is more reticent and distant from the viewer, more calm feeling. So in the past, it was unmitigated chaos and I allowed the chaos marks to go everywhere. Watch for it. Oh, it broke. The, <laughs> the brush broke the first time I used it, the handle broke off, so I go get it. Um, and I made this girl, I made this painting at like 11 p.m. because I didn't want anybody to be there when I like, this is the first time I ever did it. And, um, and it took me two minutes to make this giant mess on the wall, and it took me two hours to clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first I would do the, uh, the chaos marks and then incorporate the figures after, as you can see on the left. But then I began masking off some of the areas. As you can see, like I would just let the chaos go everywhere. But then I began masking it off so I could control where the chaos marks were going and kind of like control that, ex that space between the chaos marks and the representational imagery. And that's what a lot of uh, experiments I did during graduate school was between those two spaces of the painting. So this drawing or painting rabbit head, um, I did the chaos marks first. No, there we go. I like, that's how the masking off worked, and then I decided the chaos marks were going to go over there on the right, and then I added in sort of the mice afterwards that are underneath the chaos marks. And then with this painting, Two Girls in the Hand, I directed the drips using this masking technique, and so here's what that looks like. So that's where I started, and then that's where I wanted the drips to go, and then I added everything else in afterwards. 
And then this piece, cat bell. All right, we're gonna get to more cat bell. I have a whole images showing you how this happened, but you can see the, the two chaos areas were totally masked off. And then Mind the Gap uses a sort of uh, like a collage masking technique. And you can see I turned it upside down, did the chaos marks, and then turned it upside down again to allow them to drip down. And this is a sort of like, it's like a skin has been ripped away to reveal the chaos beneath the representational exterior. <laughs> All right, so this is how cat bill kind of went along. And so I started it, and then I did a little bit, and then I decided I wanted some chaos shapes, and so I masked it off. This is the first masking one I did, really, after, after the, um, the big one with the scorpion. And so this is me adding the, the chaos marks, and that's what it looks like after I took it off. And then I added everything else in. Rather fond of this piece. All right, so this is the underwolf masking technique, and so I masked. Up, you can see where I masked off like wolf's feet coming out, and then when after I took it off, I had to go in like with a tiny brush and you know move the black areas all the way to meet up with the feet. So that one was super fun. <coughs> also, this piece is totally warped for me hitting it like this. <laughs> all right. So this uh, piece is called Bodhicitta, and this was for the LA Mural Project in Missoula, and they have a series of interchangeable murals that go in metal frames in an alleyway, which is really cool. And um, so I did not get to use ink for this. I had to use a liquid acrylic, which was much tougher. And this is the only other piece I've done, like a full workup sketch before you even started the piece, because this is eight feet by four feet. Where is it located, Michelle? It is outside the alley, outside Radius Gallery. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. And you can tell on this one, this is another example of the images extending off the off the plane. They always extend off, like kind of implying that the Michelle land continues on even when we're not seeing it. And so there's the alley and what it looks like. And and this whole um, everyone in this series responded to the theme of merge. And so we all created work for that theme. And so I wanted like kind of this Bodhi is like open heart mind. And so it's just this just like total gladness that I wanted to be like emerging into Missoula for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then you can also see just things emerging from people's bodies and sort of that in and out movement. All right. And so with the dream art, I haven't talked about the dream army humanoids yet, but they're my ceramic work for my thesis. And so they're coil built, um, sort of abstract, children size, they're like this big, um, ceramic pieces. And the imagery on them kind of works in three ways. And it either ignores the form, so it just kind of goes wherever it wants, or it responds to the structure of the form, or it becomes one with the form. And so you can see here where the images is responding, it's totally ignoring the form, it's going wherever it wants. And then here it's responding, this is like an open sort of hollow bowl that the snail rabbit is in. And then these ones are merging with the form, so these are triangular cones coming out that became mice heads. And so all my works feature some a variety of scale shifting, repeating images, flip flopping, marked variety, overlap, intertwining, <coughs> density, abstract, and representational mark making. So this is kind of all can be combined to infinite variety and that's why some pieces are more, you know, they exhibit more or less of those. And so for instance like Bracken Lotus is, has less of the chaos mark, abstract marks, but it has more representational imagery. Whereas Underwolf, you know, repeats um, characters and then has the abstract marks. My works are monochromatic, and this is important because color tells you how to feel, and I'm not trying to tell anyone how to feel, least of all myself. 
I go through a lot of trouble to distance myself from my the emotional content of my work and kind of get it outside of myself so I can get another look at it kind of more objectively or like less emotionally. Um, and colors, the black and white is just cooler than like kind of that hot emotional content of color. And it also reads more like text on a page and so it kind of prompts the viewer to look closely in order to construct their own narrative instead of like having, without a clue, like colors give you a clue on how to read a work and you kind of have to make it up yourself. And so I put color behind some of these works just to show um, what it would be like if there was color. <laughs> Pizza? <laughs> All right. So with, when the, the thesis was really cool because I got to put my ceramic pieces in around all my drawings and so it kind of created almost an insta installation world and it kind of created an environment for the, for the humanoids that we were And the paintings are created in past time even though the viewer may be experiencing them in present time. Whereas like when you're next to a sculpture that like is the size of a small person, you kind of experience it in present time because it's like standing next to a person. And so when you have this setup of past time and present time, your brain, like humans' brains experience this projection into future time because we all experience time like the past, the present, and the future all at the same time because we can conceive of that in our mind. And so by <laughs> adding them together, it created this projection of the future time of the kind of this Michelle Land world that may continue to exist. And so when I construct images, they come from this kind of meditative practice that I started doing when I was swimming a lot in grad school because the pool is right across the hall from the ceramic studio, which is great. And so when I would go in the pool, I would make this, I made this game because I had to make a lot of work really fast with a lot of images, and I, I knew right when I got out of the pool at like eight in the morning, I was gonna go paint, and I needed something to paint, and I had to do that like almost every day. <laughs> and so that's a lot of images to come up with, so my game that I came up with to, because then I didn't wanna just paint anything, I wanted to paint something that was real, right, in my mind that mattered to me. And so when I was swimming, I played this game that was like, okay, what am I thinking about? And then my brain will just respond, like, you're thinking about breakfast, you're thinking about this concern you had about your family, or you're thinking about like a trip you're gonna go on, or your students you're gonna teach, or you're thinking about your toenail, like, I don't, like, whatever it was. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would just be honest with myself about whatever I was thinking about. And then I would say, okay, well, what does this thing look like in my visual language, like in Michelle Land? What would that look like? What would, it, what would a forest of trees look like in Michelle Land? This is where Cat Bell came from, actually. You're getting super secret information right now. Um, <laughs> Cat Bell came from, I was swimming, and I said, like, what do I think about? And I was thinking about a forest, and I said, well, what would a forest look like in Michelle Land? It'll look, and the first thing that came to my mind was just like, a forest of legs. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the core image for Cat Bell. And so then I would start with the force of legs and then keep swimming and then say, okay, well, what else? Because there's a big panel and I have to fill it up. And so then I'll be thinking force of legs and then maybe there's like, I want to see some hair that looks like a river. And then I would just keep on adding in things and you just can play the game as long as you want. And so the, the only uh, challenge with this game is that I would have to remember everything the whole time I was swimming for a half hour, and that's a lot to remember. And so I would encode it into weird sentences like forest of legs, plus you know river, plus uh, like mice melting through clouds or something. And um, and so I would repeat these sentences to myself while I was swimming, and my fellow swimmers had no idea. And <laughs> And then I would like rush back to my locker room and like quickly type them into my phone so I wouldn't forget all these weird sentences. And so my phone is just full of these weird sentences. Um, and we've got technical postcards from Beyond Interior, woman milking self spraying from south east corner of page, um, diving into subconscious from cliffs of animals. 
a mitochondria mice fluffing a mitochondria quilt, fairy lights in the morning, floating balls of blizzards. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some of my influences. This, these are images are from Lee Jin, who's worked in ink for 40 years. And in 2015, he switched from doing color, he's a master of ink and color, and he switched from color to black and white. And he said that he can even feel the warmth and coolness in black and white ink. There is something beyond the immediate recognition in painting which makes it more precious. As sensitivity and directness reflect your interiority, a person's warmth or coolness is on the spiritual level. And so here's Legion working with his giant brush. And he says that ink leaves you know, an indelible trace of all there is within you. Because no matter what motion you make, it's going to pick it up. If my hand wobbles a little bit, the ink will show me that it wobbled. Which isn't necessarily good or bad, it just will show you. And so I feel like I have some of this in common with Legion just because of our material that we work in and ink. And so we're sensitive to this immediacy and this response of the ink showing us what's inside of us. He painted like a lot of food for a while and he, he kind of was radical in the ink world because he didn't paint landscapes, he painted like really ephemeral things of the sensory world. And so I also use giant brush <laughs> when I can set up to do big ink painting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so three movements that my work relates to are maximalism, super flat, and surrealism. And maximalism, you can, like, it's just a pouring on of information, like the whole picture plane is filled, and my work is the same way, there's overflowing with images. And it's characterized by this like receptivity in art practice. It's pouring on, not editing out, but adding in. And it's attitude and approach that welcomes things in. And when I open my mind to this filming game, I'm just welcoming images as they arise instead of saying, oh no, can't have this image, it's too weird. Um, so maximalism encompasses more than visual excitement. It's about the power and necessity of plurality and tapping into what makes us human. It's about being omnivorous and about seeing the world with open eyes and about expressing who you are and what you love. And it's so energetic. Just love it. So there's a picture from my. Is that Japanese game show? Is that a TV set or is that a real painting? That's a TV set. Okay. Is that so that's 3D like the bedroom one? Yeah. Because <laughs> at first I just thought it was like a curtain. Yeah, it does. It, it flattens out a lot because of yeah. those solid colors, um, which, yeah, so good noticing. And it relates actually to super flat in that way, where it has those big solid colors and lots of information. So this is Takashi Murakami, and he started the super flat movement with his manifesto in 2001, and super flat is a view of art that rejects hierarchical divisions between different artistic genres or eras. And so like something from ancient could be with smiley faces from Hello Kitty, and it would work in super flat. Which is like, we're probably really used to that now, but this is pretty radical. And, um, and let's see, it also frees artistic activities from definitional boundaries. Super flat refers to the flattening of the picture plane and the collapse of the divisions between high and low art. And my thesis show Heartbound in the Dream Army. I also used like fancy drawings on fancy panels with, but then I also made those drawings, those paintings that I showed you into coloring books, and so it became low art as well. So this is Takashi Murakami with Ken Kenny and Kanye West, and they did some collaboration, and Takashi Murakami was responsible for this image from Kanye West album, Graduation, which is excellent. And there are my coloring books, not Deborah coloring. That's me. That's Deborah, <laughs> my sister. And then this is also, you can see that Takashi Murakami's signature flower image is on a skateboard deck, which is definitely would be considered low art. And then it's also on a 10 meter bronze sculpture outside a very fancy museum. 
and then it's also in this fabulous animation. <laughs> and so this fire character is going to stomp all the way with this child. <laughs> that fancy building. I read that his um, flowers, like the flower in Japanese culture, I don't know, like anything that's wrong is all my fault. Um, so I think I heard that the flower was symbolic of like life and death, which is cool. And so you can see sort of my work also fits in various spaces of why I'm aware. So maximalism, superflat, and surrealism all utilize receptivity, and surrealism in particular uses uh, receptivity in art making, and they use this method called automatism, which is an activity of free association of images in order to release the unbridled imagination of the subconscious. The surrealist movement really uh, prides, um, prides the irrational and the unconscious over order and reason and encourage passivity even in the artist in order to bypass the logical, rational um, constraints of the artist's mind. And so that's like that feeling of stepping back and allowing those images to arise. And I find that, I think that my swimming game is really similar to the surrealist game of automatic drawing technique. And both of Surrealism and my technique produces this surprising, unexpected imagery that you see here. Because that didn't necessarily say, like, hey, there's going to be a bird coming out of that tiger's face, but it just you know, happened that way. And here's a great moment that happened where all three of these movements came together in an interview. And Esquire asked Murakami, who are the greatest maximalists of all time? And he said, that George Lucas and Walt Disney were the greatest maximalists because he learned from them the importance of completely submersing themselves in a surrealist world. And you can see like these people are prolific world builders um, and had so much energy and um, images and imagination that just extended forever, even way beyond their lives. And these are some works I really enjoy in particular, The Gates of Hell, um, I really like kind of the writing figures, and they talk about life and death and the, like the finitude of the human condition in, in a way that isn't depressing. And, um, and then I love this cow by Jean de Buffet Lavache, and it's a Cyclops cow, and I saw it, saw it in the Peggy Guggenheim in Venice, and I just came around the corner and started laughing hysterically because this cow was there like around all this fancy art, and it was just one of the best moments in art for me. <laughs> and, and then these, these Al um, Ghazal and Adam Ghazal statues, which I'm saying incorrectly from Jordan, uh, this image was given to me when I was prepping for my thesis. So I had never even seen this statue when I was making my humanoids. And when they show, you can see like the big eyes and like the two heads and even the proportions are very similar. And this is from like 1700 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel like I was connecting to something really ancient and human. And then, of course, the Tibetan Tonka paintings from the Buddhist culture are a huge influence on me. And I have a giant, like, two-foot book of them that I got from the library that these images came out of. And I would stare at it for a long time because there's so much detail. And they also address just very, like, spiritual but also practical concerns about living in the world. Um, I have been told that the gods in the, the, the Tibetan tradition are not literal gods, they're like metaphors. And so that gives a lot to the reading when I look at the images. I mean, the guy has a demon in his belly. <laughs> And then these are my teachers, and they had a huge influence on me as a fledgling artist 
and I imprinted on them a lot. Because I, I don't know if it was nature versus nurture or you know combination, but this is Ted Sape and Sungu Ya and Ron Myers. And then this is when I graduated from undergrad, that was my graduating class. And um, Ted Sape's work, you can see the influence of the elegant fluidity of wine. Like, he just taught me to be sensitive to the nuance of wine. It could be like very fluid and elegant, or it could be like jagged and jiggery or you know, raw. And it's a poetic wine work, and also the ability to combine sort of image with structure is something I picked up from him. And, and then Sungyu Ya is, this is his work at the Korean Biennale of Ceramics. And um, he, he was the first time I saw anyone doing ink work in his studio. It was just like this raw ink painting. He just had like probably 30 ink drawings, just all of his over his studio on rice paper. And it was just so energetic and raw. And he just would paint and paint and paint with ink, all these characters and humans and just, he even drew like during church every day and then and like all these images and then he would source them and decide which images he wanted to build in these into these totemic ceramic sculptures which these are made of porcelain which is ridiculous and they shrink 20 percent in the kiln and it's like amazing that they don't crawl, like crack into a billion pieces like no one else is doing this out of porcelain and they don't understand why but he likes porcelain because it feels good and because it shows up colors really well, and he really wants bright colors on his works. And so you can see just for scale, like on the right, or on the left there, like how big they are. They're like two trucks. And they actually um, use the forklift uh, to, to stack them because they're two pieces. Michelle, we probably have just like a couple of minutes left. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> Sorry, I get really excited about talking. Yeah. <laughs> and so he does also animals and um, reflection on the world from uh, using characters and you can mm -hmm. see that influence in my work as well. So I really appreciate all of this and I'm just gonna have, read this sentence about Aristotle. His idea of imagination or fantasia is full of possibility. Imagination is an intermediary between perception and thinking. It is the motion of the soul caused by sensation, a process that presents an image that may persist even after the perception process disappears. Through imagination, artists are constantly translating reality. Artists are filters, funnels, and amplifiers. We take everything in and amplify that which we deem most important, thereby reinforcing certain neural pathways of the world. In medical terminology, to inspire is to breathe in. I breathe in the exhalations of the universe and it, it inspires me. In turn, Michelle Ann gives life to a profusion of characters. This evolving cast whirls and flits across 2D ink paintings and 3D ceramic sculptures. Sculptures. As I reflect on my experiences and explore my own internal and external worlds, they engage with their own symbolic environment. Michelle Ann is an inverted mirror that allows me to quietly observe my own self and the world. I am infinitely grateful to the citizens of Michelle Land for they accept reality no matter how weird it gets. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. We probably have uh, one or two one questions minute. if anybody has a question for Michelle. I ha oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, is heart vomit, is that like a person or is that a a feeling, a um, product of a feeling, like, like uh, Emily Valentine, you know, heart vomit. Uh, no, it's not a person. Okay. And um, it's not necessarily a feeling either. It is a the title I came up with to describe like the like the way I kind of think about it is all the images are coming out of my heart and I'm just sort of like vomiting them out because there's so many and they just have to like keep coming. Okay. Michelle, I'm curious your experience here at the bio station, if you feel like, like is there a time, like, do you feel like you will continue to like source from your experience here into your work moving forward or how, how do you feel like this experience has been informing your work? Definitely, it will continue to influence me, and those water creatures will crop up in my work for sure. 
um, I think it's kind of complicated because it's so fresh and still kind of still happening. And because I don't really want to tell, like, I think that letting the evolution happen instead of me being like, oh, well, it would be really nice if I evolved like this. I'm just going to evolve like that. Um, <laughs> um, but that's not really how it works. I have to like, listen to the life experiences and, and see what happens. But it definitely, one thing about being here is kind of a state of mind, because especially being if when you're here for days on end and you just like can hear the water no matter where you are, and everything goes at a kind of a slower pace and it is real, and it kind of makes you listen, um, makes you aware of like the world outside of myself, and also like how. Um, my thoughts can project onto that world in different ways. So in that way, it's maybe it's definitely influenced me being here for so many days. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, one more hand for Michelle. Thank you. <laughs>